Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Navy League's annual conference and trade show, Sea Air Space, uh, number one gathering of U.S. Navy leaders from around the world to meet with their international counterparts and also talk about strategy, technology, budgets, and more. Our coverage here is sponsored by GE Marine, Huntington Ingalls Industries, and Leonardo DRS. And it's our honor uh, to talk to the Cybersecurity Chief of the United States Navy, Rear Admiral Donnell Barrett, uh, who is also the De Deputy Chief Information Officer uh, of the Navy. Ma'am, thanks very much for your time. Sure, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, you are uh, one of the busiest people in the Navy. Uh, there was recently uh, a cybersecurity readiness review that was uh, spearheaded by uh, Michael Baer uh, with a crack team uh, that uh, we did an interview with Michael and that's up on our uh, website. And, and that was a very honest uh, effort by the Secretary of the Navy to be like, look, let me get an outside group of experts to come in and take an unvarnished look at cybersecurity in the United States Navy. You've taken a look at that uh, report. You're working with your Marine counterpart to sort of address bits of that report and how you translate it to reality. Talk to us about sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly that the report discussed and how that's shaping your thinking and how you and the Navy Marine Corps team think about the future. Yeah, so I, we really appreciated the report because the Secretary of the Navy um, had the intestinal fortitude to say, hey, look at we know we've got some issues and we want to have somebody outside look at us. You know, we've been looking at ourselves internally for several years and putting billions of dollars into beefing up our cybersecurity, but sometimes when you're living in your own house, you don't notice your windows might be dirty, right? You've got to have to have find out an outside voice to take a look and see where maybe you're missing something systemically. So we were very glad that he, you know, said, hey, I'm going to be open kimono. I'm going to give you our best people. And, you know, we did, like, for example, we had uh, captains, Navy captains on that team and other people who are integrated, integral into our cybersecurity effort who were on that team to help identify, you know, where are their challenges and things like that. So when the report came back, there were very interesting things in there. I wouldn't call anything like an aha moment. They were like, oh, my God, we have to fix this, like, this moment. Um, but there were many, many things in there that we said, okay, that is something that one, we don't have something working on yet and we need to, or that is something we have effort on but we need more effort, or maybe it's an effort that it, that is going okay and they just maybe it wasn't aware of, okay? So so some of the things that were very interesting to me were a lot of the cultural pieces too because, you know, with cybersecurity, technology is the easy part, you know what I mean? Right. You can apply a technology, a defense in depth strategy, a zero trust strategy or whatever, and all the tools and the monitoring and everything that comes with that. And that's challenging on our networks from a technical perspective because we do have disparate networks. They're old, they're not always connected well, so it's, it's a bit of a challenge. But the harder part is the people piece. How do I get so that everybody feels in the Navy that cybersecurity is their responsibility. You know, on a ship, if everybody's on the ship and there's a, the ship takes a hit, everybody does damage control. It's not even a question. You do it, it's inherent, you're saving somebody's life. People need to think that way about cybersecurity. And so how do we do that, not just at the deck plate level, like I talked about, but at the senior level too, to say, hey, cybersecurity is as important as buying an aircraft carrier. And if I have to live with one maybe less aircraft carrier so I can get a different cybersecurity capability or posture or, or, or um, uh, um, process in place, then maybe that's worth it to do that. So again, it's just challenging some, some root assumptions that we have, both at the senior leadership level and at the lowest level to make it inculcated in everything we do. Um, so how do you do that education process, right? I mean, um, President Obama used to make that joke, like whatever you do, don't have password one, two, three as your right, password, right, yeah. uh, which was very funny, until you realized the General Accounting Office, uh, Government Accountability Office, sorry, almost dated myself, uh, did a study in some, like a vast majority of some of our most classified systems like have the equivalent of password one, two, three on them. Um, and oftentimes when you talk to even the savviest senior warfighting leader, they have a tendency of saying like, well, I have really good cyber people who work for me. What, so talk to us about the base level education required even of the folks in the community, but then how your community actually works with senior leaders to think and understand this battle space as well as they understand the air domain, the undersea domain, or the sea surface domain. Yeah, so when we look at cyber and information as a battle space or an information war fighting space, um, it is new ground for a lot of people. And it's sort of, it's a bit of an odd duck where they don't understand how it integrates and goes across everything. And so that's a challenge to make people understand, like, you know, for information war fighting effects, how you can achieve those both offensively against an adversary and also from a defensive perspective like the cybersecurity review discussed. And so it's an education from the ground up. So, for example, at the Naval Academy now, all the Naval Academy students have to go through certain cybersecurity security uh, training within the course of their normal education. Um, in our A schools and some of the schools where we used to train our enlisted folks and civilians, they're getting cybersecurity training. We have annual 
cybersecurity training. There's awareness programs and things like that. But we could do more. And that's what the report gave us some, you know, some good examples of things that we could do to me even make that more on the forefront. And then you have to hold people accountable. Um, I don't think we've had a good track record necessarily of holding people accountable when they do stick that USB thumb drive in a computer and now we've got a virus, right? Um, so, you know, when we deal with uh, codes and cryptographic codes, we hold people accountable. If you screw that up, there's a consequence there. So there needs to be a similar mentality as well for accountability at the most junior level to the most senior level that it's everybody's responsibility, just like operational security, like OPSEC, you know? And um, obviously the cybersecurity stuff with Slapshot Carter, who's superintendent of the Naval Academy, uh, Vice Admiral Carter, um, worked very, very hard to put that kind of yeah. regimen in. Um, and there are those folks who say that don't we need, you know, whether we need a national from elementary school on up yeah. standards uh, in, in order to help uh, everybody because all of our information is also a collective challenge. Talk to us a little bit about adversary in, in as much as you can. How this, th it's, it's that it's a very evolving threat it includes state actors, it includes great powers, it includes regional powers that are problematic, like North, North Korea actually has a remarkably good game on this. Uh, the Iranians are on it. You look at terror and um, you know uh, uh, criminal organizations as well. Talk to us about this evolving space and how everybody, whether they wear a uniform or not, should be thinking about this space, given that I may come under personal attack and not a network because I have an important job in the national security establishment. So they might not get everything, but they want to maybe get key information, right? The hotel hacks and everything we've seen. Talk to us about how, like, what, what the threat picture looks like and how people need to think about it for their own security, but also the security of the nation. Yeah, so the environment's getting increasingly complex, but it's, what it's also doing is it's a great leveler. You know, so if I'm a hacker and I can buy a tool off the internet for nine bucks, it allows me to hack and get root access and all these other kind of things to do bad things, and I don't need to be an expert to operate that anymore, that's a great level of capability. I don't need to build a $13 billion ship if I can affect your ability to do your mission and interrupt your war fighting by, by hacking or by stealing information or something like that. So there's, there's pieces that are um, definitely concerning and we have to be aware of, okay, what are the things that are out there? And we always have to think in terms of how we can use a capability against an adversary. We're not going to just take the first punch, you know, but and how they might use that against us. So you have to have people who are thinking through operational scenarios, how that might affect traditional lines of war fighting or those kind of things, how it might affect our SCADA, our ability to protect our in critical infrastructure, right? Um, and then you can take a step back as well and think about, okay, so if those capabilities are out there and if they're ubiquitous, you have to assume someone's going to use them for some bad behavior. You can't do what, uh, what we call the card sin of operational planning is assuming away an enemy capability, right? You can't do that. You have to assume someone's going to use it. So you just have to have your defenses ready just in case that happens so you're resilient, so you can fight through the hurt. You may lose something here, may lose something there, but you won't stop your mission. So the way we architect and try to build our systems is to make sure that we can fight through whatever hurt, because there will be some sort of hurt, whatever that happens to be. Um, talk to us about uh, Compile to Combat, which is um, a remarkably breakthrough way of thinking about the problem, especially if you're going to be operating in a contested electromagnetic and contested cyber environment. Yeah, so Compile to Combat in 24 Hours is the Navy's uh, transformational effort to modernize how we deliver content and applications and data between the ship, our warfighting platforms, and the shore, because we have to communicate between those. And so there's things we had to fix there, you know, how we move the information over satellites and how the information are developed so that we can move them faster. So no longer will we have big, monolithic, old applications. We're doing what you would think of on your smartphone as the kind of things you would see on your smartphone, smaller bits of code that you download from the Apple Store, for example. That's the kind of thing that we want our sailors at sea to be able to be able to do is to get that code just as fast as you might on your smartphone so that it, things can happen at a much higher rate. So when new technology comes out, when new capability is developed in the commercial world, we can quickly leverage that, throw it on our infrastructure, and we're off to the races. Um, one uh, last question. How, um, two questions. One, how, when it comes to industry, some of the biggest breaches we've seen have happened, unfortunately, because companies have been targeted, sometimes maybe smaller companies in that chain that still have access to some of that highly classified information. Are we doing a good enough job in terms of telegraphing and forcing on the industry side the standards we expect companies to meet for security of some of the nation's most important information, right? Like once you learn a secret, yeah. you can't unlearn it. Right. No, absolutely. And the Navy's done, been leading the charge of all the joint communities in doing this. So there's things that are being pushed to 
change regulations like the DFARS regulations to tighten that up. But the Navy took a step, a bold step last year under Secretary Gertz and um, the, the U.S. Navy to make sure that we tightened up the language that we use in contracts about how that information needs to be protected from our industry partners. And we worked with them on developing that policy because we want to make sure it's, it is indeed executable and it will secure the information more uh, appropriately. They have the same challenge we do. They want the information secured just as badly as we do. And so in a world where things are going to the cloud, are getting dispersed, you know, our networks are no longer just what we're concerned about, it's our information wherever it is. And so our industry partners and the work we're doing with them and being on the cutting edge of implementing a little bit stricter controls and better ways of doing business to protect that will help us. And uh, last question, what, uh, what keeps you awake at night? Is it the cyber Pearl Harbor, as some said, or rather the creeping, slowing attack? And what actually allows you to sleep well at night when you think about what we're doing right and Sort of, so it's, a, it's the yin and yang question. Melatonin helps me sleep all <laughs> night. <laughs> um, no, but what keeps me up at night is the uh, attack of our SCADA, our national infrastructure, critical infrastructure. Um, that is a concern for me. And I know Department of Homeland Security and others are working very hard on that. That's a tough, hard, monstrous problem, okay? Uh, because the second, third order effects of that are quickly catastrophic, right? Um, the other piece that concerns me is the manipulation of information information operations. So no longer does someone have to take down your network. If they change the calculus of decision making because they're changing information, how it's perceived, you know, we saw that during election and other things, um, it, 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 even the graphics that can make it look like someone saying they're not, you know, the first story that's out is the one that's going to stick and you can forensically go back and say, oh, you know, a month later, oh, that wasn't it, they actually did a, you know, video uh, changing the video and made it look like he was saying that. It won't matter, you know. In today's world, that happens in an internet second, and we have to be prepared to determine and, and to make sure that the way we're using the information is good, and the way that we understand our adversaries are going to use it against us is not going to be good. We have to be able to understand that environment and the complication of the internet of things. Everything is going to be connected whether you want it to or not. So the issues of privacy and things, I, I just see that that's going to increasingly become challenging for people to say, I expect my privacy, but then I want all this technology because it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, Ma'am, thanks very much. It, you, your uh, statement reminded me a little bit of what Bob Work, uh, Deputy Secretary Work, used to say. I sleep like a baby. I wake up every two hours uh, yes, screaming right. hysterically. <laughs> there you go. That's right. Yeah. Thanks so much for your sure. time. We really Thank appreciate you. it, Admiral Barrett, and, and look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.